For the first time, inflation levels in emerging markets are far lower than that in developed markets like the US and the Europe. I'm reading out from a Morgan Stanley report. This means that emerging market central banks don't have to hike rates as much as developed markets. Also, the much feared recession may also be more a developed market problem. Does this mean smart money and serious long-only funds should start increasing allocations to emerging markets and which markets? For these questions, I have with me someone who has done seminal work in emerging market investments. I have with me Jatanya Kandhari, the deputy CIO of Portfolio Solutions and Multi-Asset Group, head of macro research for emerging markets at Morgan Stanley. Jitanya, thank you very much and more importantly for dropping in uh, into our studios. Okay, well, the first question to you is exactly what I set in the theme and I picked it up from uh, one of your research reports. Is now, is there a greater case for investing in emerging markets? Yeah, thank you for having me on the show, Lata, firstly. And uh, yes, I do think that we are at the stage of the market and economic cycle for this asset class. Uh, where investors will increasingly start looking. Of course, it's a very heterogeneous asset class with uh, 24 countries that are a part of this index with different uh, macro and political cycles. But at an aggregated level, I'd say three things that really support the case. One is uh, relative performance, two, relative valuations, and three, the fundamentals. So na since 1930, if you look at data, we have seen the worst decade in emerging market returns in the last decade. They had their back against the wall uh, post the global financial crisis, and they have spent the last decade uh, reforming. And they always do when they have their back against the wall. Secondly, the relative valuations, they are at 2000 levels when you started a commodity cycle post the 1990s recession, yes. that uh, recessions and multiple crises in the, in the asset class. Valuations are extremely compelling. What's more important is currency valuations. Ex-China, the currency valuations are also back to 2000 levels and currencies contribute a third to emerging market returns. So that is very bullish. And then fundamentals, as you said, inflation in emerging markets is not a demand-led structural problem. Wages are not an inflation here, an issue for inflation like the US. The supply-related issues, which have the food, energy prices, or the supply disruptions, that have caused uh, inflation uh, peak inflation to peak now actually peaking in some of these markets and more importantly the central banks have been way ahead of the curve for example uh, central banks like brazil have raised rates by 1100 basis points since uh, 2021 the last quarter when us was not even talking about tightening so they've been preemptive demand uh, is clearly uh, picking up post the vaccination and the opening up of these economies and that's say the four structural drivers are reform momentum, the, the commodity cycle, which supports some markets, digitization, which is a big growth driver in many emerging markets, uh, and manufacturing because of the supply chain diversion that's happening in the geopolitical world uh, where China is in focus. Okay. Well, actually, I had some of uh, the uh, you know graph uh, plates that uh, uh, Kandhari gave me before she came in. And uh, clearly, in terms of valuations, I, I'm, I'm not able to show. It's a ra rather large chart. But uh, I want the inflation numbers to come up again. And uh, you will get an idea. You know, uh, Brazil uh, and um, uh, Mexico are still higher in terms of emerging markets. But uh, US, 8.5%. Euro area, 8.6% inflation compared to a, a whole host of Asian countries. You know, India, Philippines, South Korea, all of them six or below six percent so uh, clearly that proves the point okay but uh, uh, jitania within the emerging market basket what's the case for india first i'm i'm i want to say this that i'm really very <laughs> positive on india again at a relative level uh, so i'd say a few things happening uh, india has never been a manufacturing story right it missed the manufacturing bus when china joined the wto china was 
the manufacturing economy that lifted a lot of the emerging market boats with it. Uh, but India has been services driven. Uh, that's a large part of the exports. Uh, so this time I'm beginning to see some signs of a manufacturing pickup in the supply chain with the supply chain diversion. I, I hear it anecdotally in pharmaceuticals, in you know Apple setting up facilities here, in, in uh, chemicals, et cetera. So I'm hoping that the long awaited manufacturing pickup will happen. Most importantly, I find the credit cycle of looking extremely interesting. So if I look at the Indian consumer, I look at the Indian corporate, and if I look at just the, uh, uh, the you know, whether it's uh, the, the government, uh, uh, the banking sector, there has been a deleveraging that's happened. So the last 10 years, private credit to GDP in India has actually degrown. In China, that number is 65% up. So credit has grown in excess of GDP by 65%, as an example. There has been a cleanup. Banks look very well capitalized. If I look at real estate developers' balance sheet, gearing is down. Uh, the affordability for the uh, consumer is looking extremely compelling, even in the real estate space. Price income ratios, which is a gauge of uh, affordability across different markets, that's down to 3.2 versus, say, a 6.7, actually one of the lowest Price in the world. To the income. Yeah, relative to the income, average income of an Indian uh, household. household. So look at a lot of these metrics. I feel at the banking sector level, at the corporate level, and at the uh, consumer level, uh, I find a lot of uh, uh, positive developments that will help initiate a credit cycle. And a credit cycle is always import important for a growth cycle to take hold. Mm -hmm. uh, demographics, et cetera, we know are uh, uh, clearly compelling, though uh, the world is on a depopulation, uh, degrowing yes. kind of trend. Uh, but relatively, again, uh, India stacks up. Uh, so I do, you know, reforms which have been initiated by the Modi government once you know, at one point even we were skeptical, but we're beginning to see the fruits of those reforms, whether it's the unique identification number, how the digital penetration is spreading, and how these reforms are actually supporting the whole momentum uh, on the growth side. Uh, so, you know, looking at all of these things, as I mentioned, the reform cycle, the digitization, uh, just the recovery post-pandemic, the credit situation. Uh, I have longed to see investment to GDP pick up in India because, again, that is the killer app for growth. That's not picking up. And, and if that picks up, uh, uh, it would be great. But nothing happens in India in a straight line. It's always incremental. And I'm just seeing the delta of that incremental change uh, getting positive. positive. No, I take your point. We, are, uh, we have a lot of debates worrying about the fall in savings to, uh, uh, to a GDP ratio and investment to GDP ratio. But, uh, you know, I was interested in another plate you had about comparing India's real estate sector with the Chinese real estate sector. So two questions here. Do you uh, see the Chinese real estate sector dragging the Chinese economy itself? And can that be a killer reason why money could get diverted from China to India? Uh, definitely one of the reasons. And I'd say the India versus China real estate sector are two opposite ends of the spectrum. So let's start from the top, right? The, the share of G, uh, GDP that's from real estate and ancillary industries, again, this is uh, you know, work done academically, is 25% in China. Huge part of the economy, huge part of the growth of the economy. In India, depending on estimates, it's anywhere between seven and 9%. So the starting point in terms of the real estate contribution to both the absolute GDP and GDP growth is much more favorable. More interestingly, as I said, uh, the Chinese consumer is stretched. China's credit to GDP has grown overall, but consumer credit has grown up driven by mortgages. In India, the reverse has happened. Actually, India, in the last 10 years, real estate prices have been flat Absolutely. as per data that we look at compared to many other markets. Uh, India comes in the lowest with Brazil and some of these other cases. So the starting point in terms of the consumer, in term, uh, the affordability, as I said, price income ratios, uh, uh, and also on the developer side, Chinese uh, developers are 
completely clogged. There's a lot of debt. Uh, it's uh, it's sloshing. I mean, Evergrande is not one of them. It's a lot. Yeah. It's sloshing around all over, unseen. Uh, in India, gearing is down. So if I, you know, if I had to summarize it. On the demand supply, which comes from the consumer, that's much better here. On the supply side, which comes from the uh, suppliers, gearing is much better here. And, and finally, on the fundamentals, as I said, the credit cycle, the ability to take on a mortgage, the ability to service that mortgage is, is much, much stronger here. Okay. So uh, would that be one of the big sectors you would recommend in India, real estate? Uh, what would your pecking order be? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's it, unfortunately there's not a whole lot to play for big funds like us, but definitely we we see pockets of growth. Uh, and I, I think the other uh, sector that could get supported is, of course, banking, Thank financials. Uh, uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, it is a sector that leads to construction, leads to employment, leads to job creation in the economy. So it will it tends to have that impact uh, with a lag. And I think that we are at a point uh, where that could contribute to GDP growth okay. rather than detracting from GDP growth, which has happened in the oh, last absolutely. decade. Uh, absolutely. I take your point on that. Uh, it, it was a big uh, uh, problem, say, about five, six years ago. Uh, but where is India in the picking order uh, in emerging markets? So, you know, we, we really do like India. Uh, it's one of our uh, overweight countries uh, for the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, even, you know, politically, we see uh, uh, less issues here. I mean, it's never a straight line up. Uh, there, are, there are huge political issues in some of the other markets that we track. Uh, uh, President Modi's approval is the highest in the world. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, thing. Political to stability see. is a given, yes. yes. So, so India definitely looks good. I, I do see a lot of opportunity even in other Southeast Asian economies. That are Indonesia, according to your charts, is doing very well. Indonesia is doing well. We are we are also taking a closer look at Thailand, Malaysia, because these are countries that are actually seeing benefits of the supply chain diversion that's happening out of China. Uh, now, it's very anecdotal, uh, but I'm, I'm sure we'll start seeing it in numbers. I am seeing uh, export share gains in some of these markets like Indonesia. Vietnam is a big story yes. there. Even India, because of uh, you know all of these uh, little industries springing up. Uh, for example, in, in Bangladesh, it's textiles. In Thailand, it's electronic components and auto parts. Uh, in India, we're seeing it, say, in, chem in the chemical space. So in different, in Vietnam, again, it's electronics and components. So in different parts of the South e Southeast Asian continent, uh, we are seeing uh, some of this helping the manufacturing side pick up. Again, like I said, that will create employment, it will create jobs, it will create a consumption story. Yes. Uh, we are at the beginning stages. And again, these economies have also not really exceeded their credit uh, absorption, etc. So, uh, but one has to keep in mind they're okay. all sub 2% of the index. Okay. And we do like some pockets of the commodity space because we are fundamentally positive on commodities uh, given all the demand supply issues, especially in metals, okay. not so much in oil. So again, those are countries like South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia also kind of fits in there where the positive shock from the terms of trade uh, will create a good domestic liquidity cycle and a growth cycle. Okay. And all of these markets are finally okay. come out of the COVID uh, issue. Well, let me pan out and ask you how uh, fund managers think. Now, if China is not a great growth story, and it seems to be, you know, I don't think they will get to their 5.5, which was the no. given target. If that happens, do the entire EM funds uh, kitty shrink or will funds make the distinction and stay pro-EM but ex-China pro-EM? Is that a possibility? Uh, lots of lots of questions and lots of thinking around this. And I think there will, you know, the question that clients ask is China investable? Of course it's investable. The question is, where and how, and what do you invest in? Uh, so uh, it is 30% of the. This industry. is the first time they're asking that question. First isn't time it? asking. Otherwise, China was axiomatically investable. Right, and and it so there are uh, you know 
we are significantly underweight China, and we're seeing other pockets in our portfolio. Uh, there are things to play in China. I call it China 3.0. China 1.0 was 2000 when it was all about uh, manufacturing commodities. China 2.0, which was 2010s, was all about internet e-commerce. China 3.0 now is all about uh, automation, advanced manufacturing, supply chain diversion, uh, domestic sourcing, semiconductors, and that's there are a lot of opportunities because China realizes that the only way they can grow is enhancing productivity because population is not growing. Okay. So, so no, no, coming back to our point of view, I mean, we have an Indian viewership. Uh, should we expect that emerging market funds will continue to attract even if China is not a very big, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attractive force? Yes. So it, then won't, it won't happen that EMs are deserted because China is not doing. No, because there are many EMX China mandates that are being talked about in the market and also within um, emerging markets, uh, you really have to be an active country allocator. Uh, so you could, you know, emerging market index morphs over time. So in 1980s, uh, I won't let you guess, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, Malaysia was 30% of the emerging market oh, index. Okay. In 1992, Mexico was 30%. There has been no country that has been able to go above 30%. But the emerging market index still compounded 9%. So you expect that India can grab a much larger India share? India can grab a much larger share. China reached that peak of 40%, now back to 30%. I think the weight of China in the index has to mean revert downwards. But there will be other players, other markets that will catch up. And therefore, being in an emerging market actively managed fund is the way to go. OK. Well, the larger question that I ha uh, have to broach do you see a recession in the West? Uh, that is, U Europe already is in, uh, US as well. If that happens, does growth in EMs like India continue? Or will our growth suffer because of developed market recession? Yeah, so uh, I'll answer it. Uh, first, I'll answer the latter part yeah. of your question. Yes, if. Uh, uh, if U.S. sneezes, India will catch a cold. <laughs> so yeah. I do not think India is, uh, you know, immune, uh, to it. immune to it. It's very linked. Uh, the second question is, you know, as you pose, what about recession? So I haven't been in the recession camp for the last year. And I think recession for the next year also is a 50-50 possibility. Uh, now, why has recession uh, uh, probability gone up because of monetary tightening, fiscal contraction, oil is up, uh, there's an oil crisis, and there's no China and Europe to the rescue. That's the reason. But but we need to really dig in below. What is really happening in the U.S. is, though past recessions have been caused by some of these issues, there is no excessive leverage like the global financial crisis. The, the, the consumer, the corporates are not in those kind of elevated uh, debt leverage. positions. Uh, U.S. wages are growing 5 6%, depending on the metric you look at. Uh, U.S. Uh, in unemployment is 3.5%. There are wage gains. There will be a slowdown. But there is a lot of internal defenses. And you know, oil prices, yes, they impact the consumer, but they help the producer side of the U.S. economy, where shale is a big yes. part of the economy now. So there are these offsetting balances, and I am not sure if we are 100% getting into a recession. We could soft land. Clearly, growth will slow, like we did in the 1965, 1984, 1994, where we could have a soft landing uh, situation. Okay. If the Fed were to get very tight, okay. I'd be more worried. Running out of time, so I have to ask you my final question, yes. and I'm banking a lot on this. Okay. <laughs> if you got $100 today, how would you allocate it? Where, how much would India get? And three years from now, or five years from now, if you had that $100, where do you think the allocation will be? How Will India's allocation be higher? Uh, so you're saying where would I allocate it in equities or in every Equity. asset in equities? Everything, okay, everything. So India is, so I definitely own uh, some real assets because I think inflation is the name of the game. I mean, it's not going to be 8%. When you say real, you mean commodities and real estate? Commodities, real estate, private 
uh, equity. Yeah. We are not going to, you know, inflation is not too... Okay, let's keep to equities. Yeah. I think that'll be simpler. Okay. If, so, if you have $100, which equity market? I, I will definitely invest in emerging markets because I think US is at 100 year high in terms okay. of performance. Within emerging markets, I would have India. It's 15% of the index today. I'd own much more than that. Okay. Uh, uh, I would own Southeast Asia. I would own some pockets of Latin America. I would own pockets of Europe okay. because I think it's decimated. All right. Oh, yes. And five years from now, do you think your allocation to India is likely to increase? Do you see enough trends? Uh, yes, I think, like I said, India is 15%. I think India could demand a greater share of the MSCI EM index as this index morphs. I don't know if it'll go to 30%, but I, I'm sure it, the trend is up. There are risks, Lata. If oil goes to 120, yes. India is in trouble. If the government doesn't create jobs for the youth, then you cannot have any growth cycle if there's no good employment and there's a skill mismatch. So those are risks. And India has run up. So we are very conscious. Exactly. Of I was going to bring the valuations argument as well. Yeah, very expensive market. But it's keeping up with the valuations have gone up with earnings going earnings up. Growth. So and return on equity going up. Now, if that were to change for any reason, there will be a derating. So this is not going to be a straight line up like everything is yes. uh, it will they, we will be up and down but I think the structural trend is up okay. regardless of those caveats I think this is one of the most bullish conversations I've had we had a lot of conversations on India at 75 but this clearly uh, is ranking as one of the more bullish conversations well we have to call it a day on this edition of Indianomics thank you very much for watching stay tuned there's lots more lined up for you